vulnerability to future suicidal behavior, to frame targets for early intervention to decrease incidence of a first suicide attempt in at-risk youth. She's also interested in racial disparity present in suicidal behavior among young children and was a member of the Congressional Black Caucus Task Force examining risk factors, practice, and policy recommendations necessary to decrease suicidal behaviors in Black youth. Uh, Dr. Sheftel receives funding from National Institute of Mental Health and American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Very glad to have Dr. Sheftel here with us. I'm looking forward to a great presentation. So uh, join me in welcoming both our presenters and we'll let uh, Dr. Birch kick us off. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Dr. Trevino. I am delighted to be here. Um, I am looking for my slides. Um, Dr. Trevino, can you, are you sharing? Are you able to stop sharing? Okay, so um, my PowerPoint slides are not showing. Catherine, would you would you be yeah. able to run the slides? There we go. There we go. Okay. Advanced. <laughs> thank you. This uh -huh. happened earlier today. Um, thank you. Um, yep. If you would advance. Okay, just a uh, brief, I, I do receive uh, funding, research grant funding from NIMH, CDC, and PCORI, and I'm a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of Clarigent Health. Next slide. Um, so before we begin, I think we are doing three polling questions. Is that correct? Um, so, and I'm just going to apologize up front. Dr. Sheftal and I um, put our polling questions together before we put we came up with our slides and we realized that it's probably best if we just do the polling questions at the beginning. So um, so we're going to get all three in um, at the same time or one after the other. Catherine, would you put up the first one? Okay, and I'll read it just in case anybody uh, is having a hard time seeing that. Among youth aged 10 to 19 years in the United States, suicide ranks as the what number leading cause of death? Okay, excellent. This is a highly informed audience. Uh, it is the second leading cause of death. Next question. Okay, between 2010 and 2019, suicide rates among youth aged 10 to 19 years increased by what percent? Okay, a little better distribution. All right. Okay, it is 48%. Okay, uh, next question, please. Between 1991 and 2017, rates of suicide attempt decreased among US high school students across all racial and ethnic groups except in this group. Okay, excellent. This is, uh, it is among black youth. That's the correct answer. Okay, well done. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is probably uh, information that you already know. And so I think I'm gonna go through this quickly. Um, would you advance? Perfect, if you stay right there um, and we look at suicide rates among 10 to 19 year olds, what we look, we do see a decline from 1999 through 2007, but an 88% overall increase um, from that point on. Next slide. 
um, advance, advance, two more times, perfect. Um, and what we see here is that this increase occurred in both male and female youth, um, but among females, the percent increase was uh, almost 150% compared to a 75% increase in males. Next slide. Uh, we do know that suicide rates in um, males are about three times higher than females and represent almost 80% of all um, young suicide deaths um, in the US. And let me orient you to this slide. So what this slide is showing is this was uh, a paper that was done by Dr. Donna Roosh and um, colleagues within our center um, was published uh, in 2019. And what this slide is showing is that um, the blue dots represent suicide rates among um, males. Um, the upper panel A is among um, youth aged 10 to 14. The lower panel B is among um, those aged 15 to 19. The sort of yellow gold um, circles and lines, um, those are rates in females. And what you can see is that the, the gap was widening in the early 1990s. It began to um, decrease through 2007, um, but, but it's been, uh, and it's been decreasing um, ever since. Uh, next slide, please. What this slide shows is, um, takes a second to orient you to this slide. So um, what it's showing is an incidence rate ratio. And so what you see here is um, on the x-axis is years. So 1975 through 1991, 1992 through 2006, 2007 through 2016. And um, what it's showing is that um, the, the gap that um, females are, are increasing. So the gap is narrowing um, over time um, within demographic subgroups. And it's not, not exactly the same pattern in each subgroup. For example, um, uh, the gap has been narrowing more closely among white non-Hispanic youth, and there's more of a curvilinear. So it, it, um, it was narrowing, it started to widen again, and then it's narrowing again in the most recent period among black non-Hispanic youth. And then among Hispanic youth where um, um, data were not collected for Hispanic individuals in the US until 1990. And so that's why that's blank, but you can see that the gap is um, almost one. So it's almost a one-to-one -one ratio in the most recent period. Um, okay, next slide, please. When we're, we're looking at methods of suicide, um, what the slide is showing here is that um, males who die by suicide are more likely to use firearms followed by um, hanging suffocation and then other methods and poisoning. Whereas when we look at females, females are more likely, um, females who die by suicide are more likely um, to use uh, hanging suffocation as a method compared to firearms and then poisoning. Next slide. What this slide is showing is it shows um, variation in the suicide rates among young people in the US. And so the dark blue, light blue um, represent the, the lowest, states with the lowest suicide rate. And um, then the sort of tannish um, color is increasing suicide rates. Red, states in red have the highest suicide rate in the US. And what you can see here is that um, Alaska and the Mountain West uh, and Vermont um, have in the most recent period, the highest suicide rates in the US. And there are a lot of uh, theories about, about this. Um, some, some folks will talk about um, access to guns, um, greater in these areas, but it's also access to healthcare. Um, uh, these, these areas also um, uh, really struggle with distance and um, barriers to access. And so um, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a really well done study that has looked at the factors um, that could explain statewide variation in um, the youth suicide rate. Next slide, please. Um, you know, I skip, if you would skip these three next slides because Dr. Sheftal was going to be talking about um, some of this, I'm gonna move on to, okay. Well, um, what I wanted to talk about was suicide rates um, by age and sex in the US. So um, would you advance it one, Catherine? Thank you. So if we look at suicide rates among um, young people under the age of 10, um, the suicide rates are extremely low. They're very low. 
Um, if you were to look at any given year in the US over about the last 20 years, um, in no year were there more than 10 deaths among children um, aged five to nine in the US. Um, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, does not calculate um, suicide among um, uh, children under the age of five. Uh, but what you can see is that, uh, that the rates increase um, with each year through adolescence. Now, when we look at, um, this, is, this slide is similar to the one that we looked at before um, overall. So if we restrict the analysis to five to 12 year olds, when we looked at um, 10 to 19 year olds, we saw an 88% increase. When we look at five to 12 year olds, um, over the same period, there's a 280% increase um, from 2008, which would be the low point, um, through 2018. Next slide. That, this slide takes us a little second to explain. So what we're looking at here are birth cohorts. So 1995, children born in 1995 and onward, children born in 2000 and onward, and children born most recently in 2005 and onward. And we're looking at rates of suicide by age. And what you can see here is that um, this is a concerning trend in that um, if you look at the blue line, um, so children who were born in 1995, um, the suicide rates among 12 year olds, 13 year olds, 14 year olds, are lower than among the next most recent birth cohort, the two, the, those born in 2000. And then when we look at the suicide rates among those born in 2005, it really does appear, um, now there's no statistical tests here or anything like that, but it really does appear that the rates are increasing um, with, the, with these earlier birth cohorts. Catherine, would you advance at one? Okay, and this, so if we look at the most recent birth cohort that was born in 2010, we have data through 2019. Um, it's really hard to interpret what that means right there. And so I, um, um, Catherine, would you advance one? Okay, so what, what, what I've done is um, it broken down the data just to put this in a little bit more perspective. Um, so if you look at suicide by age in these birth cohorts, from, from 19, the birth cohort in 1995, there were no children aged five to nine who died by suicide in that birth cohort um, across those years. In 2000, um, there were a few. And these, these, again, these suicide rates are very low. What's concerning as an epidemiologist and a suicide prevention researcher is that when we look at this most recent birth cohort in 2010, we see a much higher um, rate of suicide. Now, that 0.25 per 100,000 represents 11 suicide deaths. Um, and I mentioned earlier that we've never seen, um, well, it's actually the eight, um, so the age with eight and nine, there were 11 deaths. And um, that, that has never happened as far as I'm aware of uh, in the United States. So th these are concerning trends. Next slide. Um, okay, and this slide, um, just in the interest of time, this is looking at non-fatal self-harm presentations to emergency departments among five to 12 year olds. Again, we see this enormous increase, a 454% increase from 2008 through 2018. These data do not take into account COVID. Next slide. Um, okay, so, um, there were, so one way of studying suicide is to conduct studies called psychological autopsy studies. And in a psychological autopsy study, um, individuals who know the person who died by suicide well, um, in this instance, mostly parents or, or a guardian, um, provide information in a very um, structured interview about the decedents. And psychological autopsy studies have been used for decades to understand risk factors for suicide. Um, and there are three main um, uh, epidemiologic um, psychological autopsy studies that were done in the US. And unfortunately they were done um, many years ago. So Sh Dr. Shafi um, conducted a study in uh, 1988, Dr. Schaffer published one in 1996 and Dr. Brent, um, one in 1999. And what I want to do here is, um, would you advance one, Catherine? 
Thank you. So basically, when we look at all of the data from these studies, these are, these are some of our best information on risk for suicide among young people. There are only four preteens um, who, were ex who were studied in these studies. And so, um, next slide, please. And so the um, National Institute of Mental Health has prioritized preteen suicide um, uh, um, uh, as a research focus. Um, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention, um, both, these, both these foundations have prioritized um, understanding risk. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics all have focused on um, preteen suicide. And so um, in the interest of time, uh, um, there are, I, we can talk about this, um, but what I wanna say is that we, we really need to do these, these types of studies in um, young people that have died by suicide um, to better understand risk and protective factors. Um, so I think you can advance too, Catherine. So with that, I'm gonna, um, great, thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Well, thank you, Jeff, for getting us started. So I am going to be talking primarily about Black youth suicide and some steps for potential um, suicide prevention. Um, just so everyone is aware, I do receive funding from the National Institute of Mental Health and the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. So this slide looks very similar to, um, it's just oriented this way versus this way. Um, and this is talking about the problem of black youth suicide specifically. So in 2019, black uh, suicide was actually the third leading cause of death for black youth 10 to 19 years of age in the US, accounting for 323 deaths. And when you look at the data from 2009 to 2019, it actually increased substantially, the rate increased substantially 62% to be exact. So I wanted to give you guys a timeline <laughs> to be honest on what has happened in, in the last couple of years. Now, this is not an extensive timeline. There has been other research done, um, but I wanted to give you some insight on the, the work that we've done and where that work has led to. Um, so this is from 2015 to current. And uh, what, when we first started uh, looking at Black youth suicide, it was back in the day <laughs> in 2015 where Dr. Jeffrey Bridge actually conducted a study because he was contacted by a media outlet about a, um, a young child, eight years old, I believe, who had died by suicide. And we hadn't really looked at the rates of suicide in that age range. And we decided, well, he decided primarily that it was time to potentially look at those rates. And when he did so, the, the line was flat. We didn't see any changes in the rate of suicide for five to 11 year old youth. However, when he broke it down by race, what we found is that black youth were actually experiencing an increase in their suicide rate, whereas white youth, five to 11 years old, were experiencing a decrease. So this prompted us to do another examination of the data. And in 2016, um, I published a paper with Jeff uh, that looked at factors that occurred prior to suicide death for five to 11 year olds versus 12 to 14 year olds. And what we found again, is that youth five to 11 years of age were more likely to be black. They were more like to, likely to be male. And then also if they were diagnosed with a mental health concern, they were also more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, whereas with the older youth, they were more likely to be diagnosed with, and when I say older, it was 12 to 14 year olds, excuse me, early adolescents. When they were diagnosed with a mental health concern, it was majority depression or dysthymia. So after that was all said and done, a plethora of other papers were done. And um, in 2019, actually 2018, we did a study um, that actually, this is the, the, the slide that I presented at all times, where we found that youth five to 12 years of age, black youth five, 12, five to 12 years of age were two times more likely to die by suicide, almost two times, uh, than their white counterparts when we looked at the data from 2000 to 2015. And then when you got to age 13, that rate actually decreased. So going back to that previous slide, um, 
the Congressional Black Caucus Emergency Task Force was implemented that looked at Black youth and mental health and suicide. And I was very honored to be a part of that uh, actual task force. And we wrote the Ring the Alarm report that came out in December of 2019. And there was a, a substantial um, presence in the media concerning Black youth suicide and what potential risk factors could be and how could we actually prevent suicide in this younger age range. Um, and then in 2001, there was a bill that was presented to the House uh, calling Pursuing Equity and Mental Health um, Act that was actually very much driven by the Ring the Alarm report. And then in June of 2001, uh, NIMH came out with um, requests for applications that was specific to Black youth suicide prevention. And then also myself and colleague wrote a paper um, in 2001 discussing what approaches could be taken when considering Black youth suicide prevention. So I'm going to go through some of those, just so you guys are aware of what was found in some of those um, articles. So this is the uh, Michael Lindsay and myself wrote this paper in 2019, looking at the youth risk behavior surveillance data, which is conducted by CDC. Um, every other year, they look at middle schools as well as high school youth. Um, high school youth has been going on since 1991. And what we wanted to do is figure out were there any racial differences between self reported ideation, attempts and attempts that led to medical harm or injury. And what we found is for Black youth, there was actually a 73% increase found from 1991 to 2017 um, in the rate or the self-reported percentage or proportion of, self, of suicide attempts for Black youth specifically when you compare them to the other groups of youth, racial and ethnic groups. Also, we found that there was a 120% increase in the rate of Black youth um, reporting a suicide attempt that required medical attention. So again, they had the highest rate present across the years. Um, it, it waxed and waned, but when you looked from 1999 to 2017, that was a 120% increase found. And this is what the Ring the Alarm uh, report cover looks like. Um, it was uh, Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman was the task force chair. Um, and again, it really talked about the epidemiology of Black youth suicide and mental health, the policies that were necessary in order to actually make changes, and then what the recommendations would be for prevention um, and also policy as well. So last but not least, I just want to talk a little bit about an article that uh, myself and colleague Adam Miller wrote um, in JAMA Pediatrics. And it talks about what kind of research agenda would be necessary to help prevent Black youth suicide and to give us some insight on what Black youth suicide risk factors look like and, and what we could in, entail to actually make preventions more adequate and efficient. And these are the recommendations that we had. First and foremost, we really don't understand what those risk factors are for Black youth specifically. So we believe that number one, that's the first step. We have to have research that is geared towards understanding what these risk factors are. And I myself think that culturally relevant risk factors really have to take, be taken into consideration. And those things are discrimination, stereotypes, stigma. And we really need to understand not only from a research perspective, but from also the Black youth and their families' perspectives, what they are experiencing and how that can relate to suicide and suicidal behavior in our youth that, and what we're seeing. The other thing that we had recommended is we really need to take the theories that are present that, pres that are presented, excuse me, in the field and see if they actually are relevant and actually are um, not only relevant, but can be tested with groups of minority youth. Right now, the majority of, of the theories that exist have primarily focused on white youth. And that has been the case for quite some time in the field of suicide. And we aren't really sure if the theories are universal. We say they are, but we're not 100% sure if that is the case. And maybe they are, and we can test that and, and 
be fine in doing so and saying that they aren't universal, or maybe it's necessary for us to actually establish new theories concerning suicide and suicidal behavior in Black youth specifically. The other thing that we need to understand is the trajectory. So some research has actually shown that Black youth that they don't endorse suicidal ideation prior to a suicide attempt occurring. And that may be for a number of reasons. It may be that suicidal ideation looks different in Black youth overall, or it could be that we're asking the questions incorrectly. And maybe it's a measurement issue versus an actual um, presence or not present. So that's another thing we really need to understand is the trajectory from maybe thought or whatever that may be to actual behavior and how we can actually intervene on that trajectory to change it. And last but not least, which I think I spoke to a little bit is using mixed method approaches is gonna be really, really important. Um, quantitative data, I love quantitative data. I talk about quantitative data all, of, all the time, but I think in terms of this specific concern, understanding where children are, where adolescents are, where adults are, where caregivers are, where are the um, practitioners and medical um, physicians and the mental health specialists that treat Black youth specifically, where are they coming from when it comes to suicide and suicidal behavior and how do they perceive the problem? And what can we do as researchers to better gear our prevention to understand these perspectives better, but also incorporate those perspectives in our intervention programs. So avenues for potential prevention could be engaging community organizations. There's a number of community organizations in Columbus and everywhere, to be quite honest, that work with Black youth and families. And they're considered trusted pillars in the community. And if we want to actually make moves in preventing suicidal behavior in Black youth, getting them involved really can make a huge difference. And not only having community organizations, but faith-based organizations. Um, Sherry Mullock created a program that was geared towards Black churches called the Haven Project. And it was really a gatekeeper training slash resource um, referral guide for all members in the church. So she made it very clear what the risks of suicide were, and then also what the signs and symptoms are for suicidal behavior in youth and adults, and then made sure that people had the tools necessary to act if those behaviors or if those signs presented themselves. And then school-based as well as an option, um, ACWS, uh, Adapted Coping with Stress course, was um, implemented by Dr. Robinson at DePaul University in, in Chicago. And what she did is she took a program and adapted it by using Black youth, adolescents specifically, and gaining their input on the curriculum. So she presented it to them and said, what am I missing? And what do I need to add? And what do I need to take out in order to make it relevant for them? And she is currently testing that um, right now. Um, and hopefully we'll have really, really good feedback that she can give to others so that we can use that in a larger, on a larger scale. And then finally, gatekeeper training programs. So doing those in after school programs, um, training barbershops and beauty salon members, uh, workers, um, the Columbus Urban League, African American Male Wellness Agency, other, again, community organizations that could be that first line of defense against Black youth suicide can really make a really big difference. So with that being stated, I think we're now gonna talk about some school-based initiatives that we've ha implemented here in Central Ohio and across Southeast Ohio. Okay, great, great job, Dr. Sheftal. Um, Catherine, would you advance this slide? Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna assume that, um, uh, so uh, the, to the question of why suicide prevention in schools, um, our center, the Center for Suicide Prevention and Research at Nationwide Children's, um, was created in 2015. And one of our first prevention objectives um, was to focus on schools. And why focus on schools? Because um, most children go to school every day. 
um, and the teachers, the staff, they know the children, they know what typical behavior looks like, and um, they're able to identify major changes in that behavior. Um, we also know that talking to a trusted adult makes talking about depression or suicide um, far less scary or stigmatizing. Um, and we, we really want to enhance, and the field has really um, begun to understand the importance of connectedness, um, social connectedness, peer connectedness, family connectedness, connectedness over time uh, in terms of serving as a protective factor for suicide and suicidal behavior. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, the program that we chose to uh, utilize is called Signs of Suicide. Um, Signs of Suicide has a, a fantastic evidence base. It's been uh, tested in uh, at least three randomized controlled trials. Um, it has been shown to be um, effective at reducing suicide attempts. So as an outcome, this is um, a critical outcome um, because it's actually um, affecting behavior, suicidal behavior. Um, the um, I'm not going to go into all the details. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But what I wanted to do was just briefly touch on um, what, what our team has done um, under the leadership of Dr. John Ackerman, is the suicide prevention coordinator in the center. Um, Dr. Glenn Thomas and I um, from Nationwide Children's a few years ago, we presented on signs of suicide at this conference. And what I really wanted to do was just show um, sort of the reach so far of what's been able to happen um, within the schools. So next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna go through all of this. I'm gonna skip this. Next slide, next slide, next slide. Okay, so um, what we've done, the program, um, since its inception in October of 2015, more than 50,000 students have received the program. Um, one of the things that happens during the program is that um, students are asked if they'd like to talk to um, a clinician or a therapist um, and, a, uh, and to, to have a clinical evaluation um, if they're concerned for themselves or for another. Um, there were about, of those 54,000 students, um, almost 11,000 asked to talk to someone. 8,500 screened positive on the screener that comes with the suicide, um, the signs of suicide program. It's called BSADS, screen positive for um, risk of depression and or um, uh, suicidal behavior. From the combination of those, there were roughly 15,000 triage assessments that were done, followed by uh, about 1,800 more formal risk assessments. Of those, um, almost 3,000 treatment referrals were made and um, 306, so far less than 1%, of all of the students that received the program received an immediate crisis referral. Um, next slide. So this is just gonna show the timeline of, of where we started. When, we, when uh, Dr. Ackerman and his team rolled, started to roll the program out in um, 2015, we focused mainly on Franklin County. We were in Fairfield and Union County. Next slide. We expanded our reach um, in the following year. Next slide and expanded a little bit more, next slide, and a little more, next, and more. And finally, this is where we are today. And one of the, one of the amazing things for me is that this was even able to, to happen. Um, the team shifted um, their, their mode of delivery during COVID and were still able to reach schools during COVID. And so, it's really a remarkable accomplishment that the, that the team has done to date. Um, our goal is to not stop here. So um, we're gonna try to reach uh, every school, um, every middle school and high school in our, um, in our um, uh, catchment area, which covers more than 45 counties. And, and by our estimation, it's about a thousand schools. So um, the team so far has done more than 175 schools, uh, but it's just the beginning. Uh, next slide. And so um, Dr. Sheftal and I, we have five minutes left. So um, we would love to uh, talk uh, more, share some ideas, um, have a conversation. Next slide. Um. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Oh, and, and a, a big thank you and a big shout out. Um, and this comes from um, Dr. Sheftal and myself to our teams, um, to the suicide prevention team at Nationwide Children's, to just a few of our many partners. Um, and if there are any questions um, or comments, next slide, um, please feel free to reach out to, to anyone on our team. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zod, Chef Dawn, and uh, Jeff, Dr. Bridge. Um, excellent, excellent overview of the epidemiology and, and school-based and, and the Black youth. I think those are issues I know at, at our department we've really been focused on, and you guys are. We are so glad to have partnership of Nationwide Children's and, and uh, researchers like both of you. I'm, I'm so impressed by what you come up with. We did have a couple of questions, um, so I would like to get those out there and, and try to keep us timely here. Um, was a question asked about the relationship. It, it focused specifically on marijuana, but, but then also about substance use. So any things that uh, either of you, I'm going to let either of you handle this one, um, would want to say about whether it's marijuana use and, and you know, our increased availability of marijuana with medical marijuana in Ohio or other substance use with uh, suicidality or, or completed suicide in youth? Sure. Um, Dr. Sheftal, are you okay if I... Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, Dr. Cynthia Fontanella at OSU in the Department of Psychiatry um, and Dr. Mary Freistad and others, um, we, we recently published a paper um, in JAMA Pediatrics that was looking at a, that, that very specific issue. And um, in, in that analysis, um, it was looking at cannabis use that was comorbid with a mood disorder diagnosis. So this was using data from um, Medicaid eligible youth in Ohio. And um, what was found is that um, there was about 11% of youth who had a mood disorder diagnosis also had comorbid cannabis use. Um, youth that had that comorbidity were at much higher risk um, for overdose, for homicide. Um, they were at higher risk for suicide, but when um, uh, we controlled statistically for other things, that association dropped out. Um, and, and they were at risk, at increased risk for non-fatal self-harm. And so I think just from that data, it's really the beginning of, of trying to understand um, more, at least within our state level, um, but also with states now um, legalizing marijuana use, um, I think we're going to be able to, um, a, a critical need is to look at the impact of legalization of marijuana use on suicide and, and non-fatal suicidal behavior. Thanks so much. I, I think that was a, an excellent, and I'm, again, glad you guys are doing that research. It's so important for us to know those relationships. We did have a question about the signs of suicide program and, and any differentials in uh, black youth versus uh, you know white youth, other populations in terms of the question specifically asked, um, is it effective for identifying at-risk black youth? So I don't know if that's something you might um, address Dr. Sheftal with the signs of suicide program in black youth. Yes, I can definitely do so. So there okay. was yeah, so there's actually two randomized controlled trials that were done, um, and unfortunately, signs of suicide did not do a good job with Black youth specifically. Um, they were less likely to know what the signs were and were less likely to identify what depression looked like. And then they were also less likely to sign up again to actually do the program. Um, so that to me says that maybe adaptation is, is necessary for Black youth specifically, um, or that potentially the school setting might not be the best setting for suicide prevention specifically for Black youth, because of, unfortunately, there are other concerns with school when um, thinking about a youth of color. So we might have to think outside the box, uh, as, as the slide says, in terms of, of what those suicide prevention programs should look like or where they can actually be implemented. 
Oh, I appreciate that so much. I think it it just reinforces to someone like me the, the importance of culture and cultural considerations and adaptation. Yes. I know I know a bit about that uh, signs of suicide program. It's excellent. And I would imagine what you're saying is you just got to get the the right things going to make it excellent for black youth also. So Absolutely. yeah, that that's a very important point. I I do hear. I hear in a question asked here um, that they'd like more signs of suicide in Delaware County. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know how how the expansion goes, but but Delaware County's asking for more signs of suicide. So uh, that that uh, I think endorses the program. I would I said uh, yeah I I actually live more toward the Dayton area. We'd love to see it uh, come a little west too. So I know I know it's hard expanding programs. Um, you guys from what I saw on your little uh, map there, you've done an excellent job in some really difficult times. All right, well, I'm thinking that uh, we should give folks a break. I wanna thank our presenters so much and, and you know, you all know how to get in touch with them. We all know Nationwide Children's is uh, our great resource for us. So uh, please do get in touch. So I wanna give us our move on. I guess we take about a 10 minute break. You have your QR code for the speaker survey. You also get an email that allows you to do uh, that uh, um, activity also. And then uh, we really encourage you, I would encourage you to return at three o'clock. We have a uh, next presentation is, is an excellent one on suicide lost survivors actually uh, know of, of the HEX there and, and the program they created uh, for suicide loss. So I encourage you to come back and get a little break, go outside if you like. It's a nice day out there, clear your head and we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you for attending and thank you presenters. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>